today we're very pleased to have one of the journey lectures which is a sort of a, a lightweight um description of someone's career up to now one of a, the faculty here we've been here for a few years so um so i'm jeremy taylor and i'm going to introduce susan here so susan murray see her lovely picture as a baby there and, and growing up um she would get her master's and phd at harvard biostatistics and her advisor at Harvard was Butch Seattis, and I think Butch is actually in the audience here. So hi, Butch, nice you could join. And um, Susan uh, did her undergraduate at Rice University and had a triple major in um, mathematics, statistics, and English. So she's covered a, a spectrum there. Um, and I know she was in the marching band at, at Rice. And I remember once getting a little muddled and I accused her of being one of the cheerleaders at Rice, but that, that didn't go down too well. So anyway, she was in a marching band. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I didn't really understand the, the difference. Um, anyway, she came to Michigan in 1996, um, actually as a, you know, an assistant professor there. And um, I remember I came in 1998 and when I was interviewed, she met, she picked me up at the airport and um, took me to a I think it probably was Grizzly Peak. I remember it was very cold. And anyway, and then I came. So you did, you you, you, had a, you played a role there. And I never, one little story I have about Susan. I don't quite remember if it was before we were, I was hired here or not. But we went, we both had a conference in, I think it was Santa Barbara. It might have been San, San Diego. Okay. So it was a, you know, glorious lo location, sort of on a cliff over a beach. And, um, so us and um, John, so another, another person decided we'd go and walk on the beach and then John had horrible shoes and struggled to get down there. Anyway, when we got down to the beach, so this is, Susan, you know, we're, this is like 25 years ago. We're quite a bit younger then. And anyway, it was a nude beach. And so we were, we were in shock, right? And we was like, well, what do we do now? You know, anyway, so that, that was a, a, Susan could probably elaborate. <laughs> Anyway, nothing, nothing happened. We just we just sort of walked along and you know like this, and, and then walked back. And um, anyway, so Susan here has been involved in many activities. She's done a lot of research with people in the sort of transplantation area and pulmonary research, and has worked many years with those folks. And she's been a very dedicated teacher and mentor to to students. And um, she actually won the SPH teaching award at one time, I don't remember a few years ago, but congratulations on that. And she was much loved by the OJOC, the, the professional degree we have, and, and was sort of voted their best teacher. So Susan, we're looking forward to hearing your journey. So welcome. So hi, everybody. Uh, it's really fun to see you in person. And to also have people who I love online. I saw my mother and my sister and had some of my academic children here and my academic dad. So uh, I, I feel just really lucky. So thanks for coming to this talk so far away from the School of Public Health. And thanks also uh, to everyone who found the time to log in on Zoom. So I've never done a journey lecture before. And so my goal for today is to give a sense of the culture I grew up in, which is maybe different from the culture today uh, in Michigan at least, and, and the role models that I was inspired by, and hopefully some interesting stories. I actually had to screen out so many interesting stories. I wasn't gonna tell that one, but I will tell you, it was just after you were hired and I was this young assistant professor and it was just mortifying, <laughs> but hilarious, but mortifying. And I remember, telling Jack Kaplas this story. And he said, well, why didn't you just turn around and climb back up? <laughs> and we couldn't, so. Anyway, so many stories are being screened out. And if you have a favorite, I'd, I'd be happy to tell one of those. Uh, also, I'm looking at Zoom uh, on the, the chat feature. So if you, if you have a question or you wanna say hi or something, I'll be looking at that on the side as well. So, So I grew up in Texas <laughs> and I was born in Houston, Texas. And it's for those of you who aren't really familiar with the United States, this is in the very Southern part of the United States uh, and it shares a border with Mexico. And so this is kind of the image the film industry gives you about what Texas is like. And so you get this very romantic view of Texas as being full of cowboys 
and some of them are fantastically rich from drilling oil. And there was a, a television show that was kind of international that was, I, I was too young to watch this when it came out, but there was a show called Dallas. And I, so I couldn't watch it, but when I saw commercials, I'd see this guy, uh, the front middle, Larry Hagman, who was J.R. Ewing, and he was always surrounded by beautiful women, totally rich from oil. And so none of this looked like the Texas I knew or grew up with as a child, but I was as odd by the hype as anyone else. And I was just like, wow, Texas really is full of rich cowboys, even though I never met a rich cowboy. Uh, so, <laughs> so this is more or less the, the Houston, Texas that I remember as familiar. And so uh, it's a very sprawling city. So there's a picture of all the traffic in Houston, multi-lane highways, and you could drive for an hour and still be within the city limits of Houston very easily. It was like an hour drive from my house to go to the Houston Zoo. Hi, Kathy. Uh, and so I have a few little points of interest here that were important to me when I was a kid. Uh, one of them is Astroworld which uh, was basically interesting to me because it was an amusement park and here's my favorite roller coaster, the Texas Cyclone. Uh, it's gotten into trouble recently because its concert venue is not run well. <laughs> but at the time, this was the place to be if you were a kid. Uh, and in fact, the Houston School District had one day every year where if you had perfect attendance or perfect grades, they closed down the whole park and all the kids on that one day could all go to Astroworld all at the same time, and it was just wonderful. So you had a good incentive to always be at school or get perfect grades, and I tended to hit one of those. Um, so that was a big thing. And then over here in the bottom right, that's a picture of the Galleria shopping mall. And I don't know if you can tell, but that's an ice skating rink. And this was the only place in Houston, Texas, where you could go ice skating. There was just, it was just too hot to have it be a natural phenomenon. And they might have many more places now, but this is the place you would go. And, you know, occasionally there'd be birthday parties that would be held there. And you'd see all these kids skating around in between the stores. And it was really kind of, kind of lovely. Uh, and then you can see it's labeled like twice on this picture, Rice University. And so this is in Houston. And it wasn't really on my radar as a kid, but my father went to Rice University and I would eventually go to Rice University and I would meet my husband at Rice University. So I'll come back to that later. So I wanted to also, for those of you who are not from the United States, I, need, I thought it was important to give you some orientation about what the weather is like. So this is, close to now we're almost into march and so you can see like where we are up here in michigan you've got average high temps around the 40s and it's about to get very very nice and actually in houston right now people are already wearing shorts and they're very happy it's a lovely time to visit um and then in august this happens <laughs> and so it's very lovely in michigan uh and in texas it is just terrible. I mean, in the 90s, it's very, very hot, very, very dry. Uh, and so since I was very little, my extended family and I would rent one or more beach cabins for a week in uh, Galveston, Texas. And then we would just go and it, swimming in the ocean was like being in a warm bathtub. And that was sort of a relief compared to not being in a bathtub, but feeling like you were making a bathtub. And uh, so anything you would leave in a car in Houston, Texas in the summertime would melt or it would get warped. You'd have like little plastic cases that would just get warped and be ruined. And so everybody stays indoors when, or it's air conditioned when you're in Houston in the summertime. That's kind of the way I grew up. All right, so my mom is here online and so sorry mom for including that picture, but. <laughs> But these are some pictures of my parents, and uh, both of my parents graduated Phi Beta Kappa at their respective universities. As I mentioned earlier, my dad went to Rice University, and my mom went to the University of Texas. And being at Phi Beta Kappa is something that was repeated to me often. This is like a really good academic honor. It means you're super, super smart, and both of my parents were Phi Beta Kappa, so very, very smart people. Uh, and before my, my dad retired, he was a math professor 
at the University of Houston. So I kind of grew up with an in-house math professor, which was very handy for someone who would eventually do what I do. Uh, and, I, and from sitting in on his classes once or twice when I was younger and still attending Rice, he was a wonderful, wonderful instructor. Uh, and so I really looked up to him firsthand experience. He was just a wonderful instructor. And so as a kid, I had two paths for bonding with my father. Okay, I could reach out to him via academics, so I could talk about math or even literature, or the other choice was I could be an outrageous goofball. And there was no middle ground. So academics or outrageous goofball, those could hold his attention, but other, no middle ground at all otherwise. And so uh, at the dinner table, it was very common for him to pose a math problem to me. And uh, I have to maybe reach for a napkin and a pen sometimes to <laughs> answer his math questions at the dinner table. That was very, very common. And at night, I would catch him reading the books that were being covered in my English classes. And he would want to talk to me about them. And so he was staying current with what I was reading in my English classes. And that was actually quite impressive that he went to that much trouble. Uh, he was you know, taking a lot of time to kind of be with me in the academic journey. And, and he's just spent a lot of time nurturing that intellect and pushing it in a good direction from the time I was very little. So I was very, very lucky. And I wanted to grow up to be just like him. Just absolutely just like him. And I can't really explain the goofball part of this relationship equation, but it seemed to work for me. And I don't meddle with success. Sorry if some of you have gotten spillover from the goofball equation that I have with with professors, but it does, it does seem to work for me. Uh, so my mother, this beautiful woman here, uh, was for most of my childhood a stay-at-home mom, which was the norm for moms that I knew at the time. And she was quite active in the community. She volunteered at a retirement home. She took on neighborhood beautification projects. She rotated as the occasional school nurse. And this is just the beginning of a very long list of things that she did. She never sat still. Uh, when I was finally old enough to manage at home on my own, she worked at various times as a translator. She spoke maybe five at least languages, uh, maybe an office assistant here or there for one or two jobs. And the last job I remember her taking, she was a private detective which was just the coolest thing. Uh, so very, very multi-talented mother. And my mother's childhood was so very different from everyone else's that I knew. Uh, she was born in Germany and her childhood memories included bomb raids in World War II and uh, times when there was just nothing to eat because someone had robbed their pantry and they had to rely on neighbors to feed them. Just really scary things. She was eight years old when the war ended and so she has a lot of these early formative memories that were just really difficult. And, um, and so she would tell us those stories, but she would also tell us little humorous stories about how much trouble she would get into with her brothers and her sister. And I remember her telling me one time that she and her closest brother in age switched clothes. Um, so he was wearing a dress and she was wearing whatever he wore and they dared each other to run around the neighborhood and not get caught. And so that was the kind of thing that she would be uh, getting into trouble on the side. Um, so I would have to say it was my mother more than anyone else that made sure that I knew that getting a good education was not guaranteed in different parts of the world. And that I was very, very lucky and that I was not to take my educational opportunities for granted. So this was a recurring, very serious message that I got from my mother. So this is uh, these are some pictures of my older sister, Annette, who is also <laughs> on Zoom. Uh, I love Annette dearly, I, but I drove her crazy uh, when we were little. She was six years older than me. I followed her everywhere. There was no like, you know, there was no phone thing to distract kids. <laughs> she was my television. She was my role-playing game. <laughs> she was everything. I followed her everywhere. And she paid me back a lot by pulling pranks on me. So I kind of learned a little bit about how to deal with some, you know, her playing jokes on me all the time when I was little. I think she was just trying to, you know, drive me away temporarily until I rushed back, still wanting to hang around with her. Uh, and so you can sort of see this picture was just sort of half 
pretend choking and half like, you're gonna leave me alone after this. So, uh, so my sister's enormously accomplished. We're very different, but she's enormously accomplished. She helped build two businesses. Uh, one was a Domino's pizza franchise in Northern Texas. And right now she co-owns a Jason's Deli franchise in the state of Colorado, like the whole state is her with her co-owners. And amongst her many talents, and there's more here than I'm gonna hit, but she was an expert seamstress. So she was so skilled, she could sew me a fabulous prom dress when it was time. And then she also sewed me this fabulous wedding dress. So just really, really high level skills there. She's also a singer songwriter with a lot of work to her credit. And she always travels with her guitar. So that's a little bit about my sister. So I was always watching her for what was cool to do when I was young. So uh, I wanted to kind of say a little bit about what other female role models were available to me at the time. And I really don't know how much this has changed from when I was young, but I suspect it's changed a bit. So other early female role models that I would see around were, first of all, the mothers of my friends, you know, and nearly all the moms that I knew had college degrees, but they stayed at home until their kids were old enough to manage on their own. And the high quality, affordable childcare just was hard to find at that time. And there was a little bit of stigma attached if you, had, if you used it because it wasn't good and it was known not to be good. But these women were just simply incredible. Uh, to the very left is my uh, friend, Carol's mom, Jane Rushing, who was a Rice graduate, you know, and she it was and is a prolific local artist. And uh, I already had two of her paintings just that she'd given me when I visited her. But while I was Googling for pictures of her during this talk, I found another one of her paintings for sale online and I snapped it up. But she's really just very, very good. So this is one of the stay-at-home moms that was kind of nurturing little girls in the neighborhood. And then this other mom is my uh, friend, Susan Wagstaff's mom. Uh, and when we got old enough, she eventually went to work for Exxon. And so she was doing very well. Like after you got to a certain age, suddenly the moms would go out and they would find jobs and they would start their careers at that time. That was kind of the path you saw, if any. And they were just all amazing women. And so I can remember being able to ask these moms for anything. So I remember asking Susan's mom, you know, my friend Susan's mom, uh, we want to be Tarzan and Jane for Halloween. And then boom, it was done. We, she had little furry costumes and we would dance around. You know, they just were amazing people. And so uh, my favorite aunt was also on the list of my role models. And she got a degree from the University of Texas and just was phenomenal. All of my many, Many female cousins still want to grow up to be just like this woman. She's wise, she's funny, funny like Carol Burnett, the comedian funny, just really hilarious. And she's a warm blanket hug, a phone call away. She's always there. Uh, she, after her, her kids were old enough, did some elementary school teaching. Uh, but I remember she also ran a travel agency at one point. I mean, she also was quite busy and quite talented. Um, she actually still reminds me of Carol Burnett. I mean, she always just makes me laugh that hard. And then the other people that I would see on a regular basis were my elementary school teachers. And here they are. So they were all women. And I remember I'd been trained to respect that education was not to be taken for granted. So I watched these women, they were definitely role models. Uh, I will say that the very, uh, my sixth grade teacher was not impressed with me at all. I, I had been doing well academically and winning academic, you know, appreciation and awards, but I was also learning how to be an outrageous goofball. I was getting quite a bit of talent of fishing for laughs with my friends in class and probably being disruptive. Kathy's nodding her head because she's seen me do this. Still, I have not given that skill away. So uh, my family knows this story quite well that she told me at one point, um, you know, I wouldn't amount to anything because I was such a clown. Uh, <laughs> and I think I have some pictures later that, that, say, that give a reaction to that, but not quite yet. And then of course the other role models that I saw 
with television. <laughs> All right, so television role models look way more fun than the women you saw every day. And so these are the favorites I had as a child. And so you can see, I don't know if you recognize this if you're young, 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 but the top two pictures are Wonder Woman and her alter ego, Diana Prince. You know, so she's always hiding how wonderful she was. And then she would, you know, burst out at the right time and she'd fix everything. There was Brian a woman who was super strong. Uh, get smart, age at 99. She always fixed up any problems that her partner who was not so smart made. And of course, Charlie's Angels, which was huge at the time. And my friends and I would get very excited when we heard the beginning of Charlie's Angels. It went like, once upon a time, this is the guy's voice. Jeremy, you know this show. <laughs> I know you do, because you're like smiling already. But once upon a time, there were three little girls who went to the police academy. And they were each assigned very hazardous duties. And then they show them like guiding traffic. It's really boring jobs that you give to like a grunt. Uh, but I took them all away from all of that. And now they work for me. My name is Charlie. And then they would show like great hair and action scenes and more great hair. And they were detectives who were under the cover and they would always solve the problems. So, um, so my friends would all like role play all of these women in these television shows. So uh, one thing that I kind of noticed as I was putting together these slides is that these shows all play off the ideas of very, very competent women either hiding their true potential or being underestimated and surprise, awesomeness revealed, and then they always, always triumphed. That was the formula. And that was the formula that my friends uh, really liked as well. So these shows seemed very modern and cool to us because we had choices like Leave It to Beaver with the boring mom who makes cookies and those weren't any fun. So these were the ones we really gravitated towards. So, my friends and I would pretend to be Charlie's angels when we were little. And if there were three of us, that was fine. If there were four of us, one had to be Bosley. And <laughs> if there were two of us, we, one of us would be Wonder Woman, one of us would be Bionic Woman. And if it was Charlie's Angels Day, I have to tell you right now, I was never allowed to be the one with great hair. I was always picked to be Sabrina, the smart one. And so I didn't get to flip my hair at all during those games. It was very sad for me. Uh, sorry, Kate Jackson, she's very beautiful, but that was like last choice. Um, and on Wonder Woman and Bionic Woman days, we would all be spinning around, magically turning into Wonder Woman. So you just imagine all these little girls like all at the same time spinning around, you know. And if it was uh, whoever played Bionic Woman would get mad and tear up a phone book, pretend, you know, because that was her thing. Uh, so it was really, really fun. And it was the way in my generation, you role played, you know, you didn't do it on the phone or on your laptop. This was role playing for us. Maybe they still do it that way, even today. So here are some pictures of me during those early days. I, I spent nearly every day with Jacinta Jacob, who is uh, next to me. I'm wearing the little red shirt. Jacinta's uh, there to the left of me. She. Uh, she came home with me every day after school because her mother worked and my mom kept an eye on her and we just were very good friends. And she was one of the smartest girls that I knew at that age. Her first job after college was working at NASA and she now works in finance. So this is the quality of the brains that I was hanging around with, very, very smart. And there's some of the other neighborhood kids with me. Some of them were in these stories about spinning around and tearing up telephone books. I'm the one at the top of the swing set. So I was always trying to climb up high and be athletic at that age. And as I mentioned before, I was really working hard at being an outrageous goofball and getting a little laugh. You can kind of tell by my face that I was up to that. And that sixth grade teacher of mine who was unimpressed with me again, remember she said, if I didn't stop clowning around, I wouldn't amount to anything, which was kind of harsh for an 11 year old. So. Uh, my reaction to that was classic. I'm pretty sure I took this picture the very day she told that to me. And I looked kind of menacing for 11 year old clown. <laughs> sure, I was thinking about her at that time I took this picture, absolutely positive. All right, so middle school, I'm trying not to take too long on all these old stories. I know they can be kind of a much here, but in middle, middle school, and Jeremy, this is very funny that you mentioned cheerleading because I think only after being promoted to full professor would I ever show this picture. 
but I was a cheerleader in middle school. <laughs> you know, but I've had to pretend to be too dignified for such a thing, you know. So I did try on cheerleading and, um, but I was also uh, in a debate team. And so here's my debate partner with me. And I kind of doubt that anybody here is from Massachusetts, but if you were from Massachusetts, she hasn't changed much in appearance. You might recognize her. So my debate partner was Shannon Liss, who is tremendously smart. And her name now is Shannon Liss Riordan, who is a famous lawyer in the Boston area who recently ran for Massachusetts state senator. And she's currently running for district attorney of Boston. She's truly amazing. Uh, famous for suing corporate giants uh, like Uber and Lyft for not paying their drivers and winning. And by the way, her son is coming to UM next year as a freshman. So again, these were the minds that I was around, all these smart women all around me when I was young. And uh, high school, in both middle and high school, I should mention that all of my teachers most of my teachers, not all, most of my teachers were women. And a couple of them had degrees from Rice University. They were very smart, very capable teachers. And I was getting pretty high quality teaching even though I went to public school. You know, So that school district was doing a good job by me even though it was public school. And my best friends were Susan Wagstaff and Carol Rushing over there with me. I'm the one that's on the right. And um, Thank goodness they didn't mind my geeky ways when they surfaced. And so in most company at this age, I was working hard to fit in and underplay my grades in school and just be like cool. And they would like nudge me when I like slipped and said something ridiculously geeky and, and I'd be like, oh, 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 you know. And so, and I balanced academics with chorus and I found these old pictures of me. Again, these are not pictures I might've showed before tenure. Uh, <laughs> But we, I think we all had a ridiculous amount of makeup on <laughs> uh, for this. But this was a shot of me in the senior musical called Anything Goes by Cole Porter. And I was one of these singing people and the solo was kind of fun. It was a great activity for me to balance with academics because between scenes, there was a lot of downtime where I could work on my homework and then pop up when it was time for me to go back up on stage and do a thing. Okay, so I wanted to go to Rice University. So we're moving into college years and, and I was lucky enough to get in. And the only other person from my high school who was at Rice that first year was Robert Denise. So only two people from my high school admitted. And he told me that the Rice band was a must have activity. So it's nice that Jeremy mentioned that in the introduction. So this is a picture of me that I found online actually. I didn't know of this picture's existence. Uh, I'm in the middle. Kind of, and I remember this is band orientation freshman year. I kind of remember that there was a gender imbalance at Rice, but this is not as, I don't think it was this bad. I mean, I don't know. My husband was joking that I just found the boys that sat in the middle, you know. <laughs> but so, but I was kind of surprised when I found this, this picture. And by the way, the drinking age was 19 in Texas at that time. And I think it's hilarious that there's a beer bottle in the picture like a little behind me, it was mine. Uh, so I also met my future husband, Eric and band, and can't look at him. And, uh, oh, my battery's running though, that's not good. This is supposed to be charging. Let me just take a moment to plug this into a different plug. Some of these plugs pretend to be real, but they're not. Yeah, that looks a little bit better. All right, so my husband, so he was in band, he played trumpet. I played trumpet quite badly. He was very, very good, still is very, very good. And I don't think he fell in love with me until I shared my notes with him for a class <laughs> we were taking. And uh, they were really good notes. So, so that, was my, that was my best feature, I think. Uh, so, on the academic side to Rice, uh, I started off my very first semester as an English major thinking 
you know, that maybe I'd go into law or something. And my dad had been a math teacher. So there was probably a little bit of rebellion there about, I'm not going to do math like you. It was just that perfect age. My kids are saying the same thing to me now. Like, I don't want to do math. And I said, ha, ha, ha. You think you're rebelling, but you're doing exactly what I did. So this really like, what do I do now? How do I rebel? Uh, so that was my first term. And I had this roommate who was an electrical engineering major. And what I noticed was she went to bed at nine o'clock and slept like a baby. And I was reading all of these books. Like they signed so many books for all my courses. And I was just reading till 4 a.m. and setting an alarm for 7 a.m. to try to attend class. And I just, it was not, it was not manageable. So my second term, I added in some math <laughs> so that I could finish some homework, at least for some of the classes and sleep. So eventually it built up into a math science major, but you know, I, I just think it's really funny that, that it's really hard to do these majors where you have to read lots and lots and lots of books. So um, I did keep the English major. I just kind of added on the math major, but that balance of having some reading and some math to do worked really well. I could sleep just fine. And then when they added a statistics major to the university, like the first who was just uh, invented when I was there, I decided I could probably do that too. You know, there was a little overlap. It was my senior year. And I said, I could probably swing this. And um, it was a bit tough because I had to take courses. Yeah. So how many of you three majors is the goal of education? Well, uh, I have always been a multitasker. So for instance, if Eric wanted to go on a date with me, he had to bring his books. And my, his parents still thank me. I mean, they, they thanked me many times over the years for being like that. You know, he had to bring his books if he wanted to date me and he did bring his books. He became very good at his classes. So, uh, and there was some overlap between the math and the statistics requirements. So I had to kind of add in more statistical focused classes, but as long as I did them all, I'd be okay. And it was not a trivial thing because I didn't have the prereqs for the most advanced ones. And I remember talking to a professor named David Scott, who I don't know if any of you would know. And uh, I said, is this gonna realistically fly? Am I gonna be able to take your class and at the same time take the prereq? And he said a very Texan thing to me. He said, sometimes you just have to bite the bullet <laughs> and hold on. And so very, very, very Texan and uh, I survived. Uh, I had very good friends. Keith Baggerly was a classmate of mine, and so was Stephen Sane. And, you know, between having them around, I learned just enough that when I got to graduate school, my mind had been pre-prepped to absorb everything. And so maybe it wasn't my best success story, but I did bite the bullet. And it was, it turned out to be a good thing to do, despite the pain I had at the time. So uh, let's see what else we've got here. So Little note, all of my math professors and most of my English professors were men. So I'd gone from all my school or prior to college having mainly female teachers. Suddenly they were all men. And I don't think I noticed at the time it was during this talk that I was thinking back through who taught me what. And they were, they were all men, all right? And I also had very few female classmates in math courses. So I was used to being unusual, but I don't remember at the time noticing I was unusual, I just noticed, you know. Uh, and then the statistics department had its first female faculty member, Kathy Enzer. And uh, so I just love Kathy Enzer. She was the first female professor hired for the department. And I never had a chance to have her as professor because I was trying to do all my courses in a year and she didn't overlap with any of the required courses. So I never had a chance to have her as a professor, but I loved her. Just the very idea of her, I loved. And if her office door was open, I was walking through just to say hi. And she let me. Uh, she gave me such a good advice and so much good encouragement at just the right time. And she was the first person who ever said the word biostatistics to me. So I'm not the first person, I know I'm not the first person to say this, but to see someone who looks like you in academia has such a huge impact. And she was it for me. Um, so my very first female professor role model, and she guided me to that next level where I saw choices 
that before were not really clear to me. So uh, my husband, Eric, he wasn't my husband yet, but Eric and I did both apply to graduate school and we were trying to find a place where we could both go to programs in the same location. He was a microbiologist and he found a place at Tufts University and I found a place in Boston as well at Harvard University. And we picked it based on the two body problem there. Uh, and so that's where graduate school started. And so this, these were mostly my classmates, maybe not in the same year, but close by. The only person who's a faculty member is Stu Lipsitz, who you can probably see, you know, sitting down uh, right between me. And do you recognize uh, Myra Kim? Myra Kim was in my cohort. So we were classmates. I actually remember sleeping on her floor uh, the night before the qualifying exam because I didn't want to commute an hour back and forth for the exam the next day after studying. And so uh, suddenly I was in an apartment with lots of female students and faculty members. And it was like that scene from The Wizard of Oz where everything changes from black and white to color. There were other women scientists everywhere, hurrah, you know? Such a dramatic change from where I'd come from. And uh, my main study buddies were Julie Legler, who is sitting next to Eric on the very lowest right. Um, she, she's now teaching at St. Olaf. And also Robert Zakin, who's kind of hiding in the background there. They were my two best study buddies. And uh, between the three of us, there wasn't anything we couldn't figure out together very good uh, people to learn and go through graduate school at your side. And I was also kind of watching the women. I suddenly had all these women role models all around me and I was watching them. Julie had three kids when she started graduate school. So I was watching like, how do you work in school and family? I mean, how does that work life balance happen? And Shelly Carter Campbell in the blue shirt, she also had a family. Uh, and Myra Kim, she had her daughter Alexa in grad school. And so I was taking all this in, like, when are people doing what? How are they managing it? Trying to kind of set up some structure for how I could imagine myself um, doing that. And Eric and I were still dating. We hadn't gotten married yet, even though we'd been dating all throughout Rise, almost from the very beginning. And we were very serious, but uh, there was quite a diff different cultural age for marriage between Texas and Massachusetts. So every one of my friends, had met their husbands after I met Eric and were already married and they were starting their families <laughs> and they were very worried about me. And none of my, of, of my husband, Eric's friends were married, not a one. And they were like, she's not gonna try to get you married early. <laughs> she, so they would, somehow we had to come to some agreement about what was gonna happen there. And we finally were ready when, when we were both 24, which seems very, very young in Massachusetts standards and super, super old and decrepit in Texas standards. Uh, so we got married and we timed our wedding right for the summer after my qualifying exam. Took a life, long, long, nice honeymoon, driving around Europe. And then I got back to work with my new advisor, Butch Ciatis. All right, so I tried to hunt down all these pictures. Uh, a lot of them were in black and white. So I just made them all black and white. So. Here are the professors and mentors that I had in graduate school. And you might recognize some familiar, familiar faces here. Of course, my dissertation advisor, Butch Ciatis, is featured there up on the upper left. And uh, he's absolutely the biggest influence on me, hands down, over the years. And then can you find young Kathy Spino? Yes. Second row. Second row. Uh, not quite all the way to the, to the right there. That's Kathy Spino. And she was one of my first professors at Harvard. She taught statistical computing. Sorry, Kathy, that I didn't go into statistical computing, but I had a wonderful instructor there. So there were a lot of outstanding professors in this group and I was just getting the best training. All kind, all supportive, wonderful. Again, Bush says was hands down my greatest advocate and mentor over the years. And he taught me to love the research process. And it's always been there when I needed advice at every stage, even today. So I was very lucky to have him as my dissertation advisor. And if I've been a good advisor to my own students, it's because I've had a wonderful example in him. 
Um, so not many people know that I didn't approach Butch as an advisor at first. And if you're interested in hearing that story, we have time later, we can come back to that. But uh, it's kind of, I, I don't know. I thought it was an interesting story to tell, but I think that we're running a little long. So I'm gonna hold it off as a teaser maybe for later. So let's see here. So after graduation, then what? So my husband wasn't close to being done with his PhD. And so when I finished my degree, Rich Gelber was very kind. Here's Rich Gelber and he hired me as a postdoc to work on some data analyses with the International Breast Cancer Study Group. And then another University of Michigan alumni, actually Diane Finkelstein, co-taught an intro biostat course with me. She invited me to, to be a co-instructor. And this was joint to Harvard and MIT students who were involved in developing medical technology of some kind. I forget exactly what that cohort was, but it was within the medical school. And so I started to spend time working on my thesis and began my first in methods for research as a postdoc and, uh, and developed a lot of collaborative skills. And I really have, I owe Rich Gelber a lot because he really birthed my skill in that area. So I was ready for the job market and uh, And so this is kind of what that looked like for me when 1996 ENAR, ooh, I just dated myself, came about, I was holding on to seven job offers, but the two that I was most excited about were the offers from Michigan and the offer from University of Wisconsin and Madison. And so here are the two chairs, Rod, who you know, and David Demez, uh, who you may, may or may not know. And so I was having a really tough time trying to figure out where to, be. They both were just wonderful choices. And uh, I knew stories like my grandparents fell in love at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. It was just gorgeous. And so I was like, oh, isn't that nice? And, uh, and then here there was hard money and a, a kind of a different, a different setup to the job that had some more financial security due to the hard, hard money that didn't rely so much on constant grant writing. And both of these chairs were at ENARF, you know, making sure I knew what was going on with their departments. And my advisor, Butch, was there. And there were other mentors, including Diane Finkelstein and Butch's wife, Marie Davidian. You see their wedding picture that happened while I was a postdoc as well. And Diane Finkelstein at ENAR gathered a bunch of women together who either studied or worked at the University of Michigan in the biostatistics department. And they took me aside and talk to me about what it was like there. And I have to say that it was a bit intimidating to hear what it was like. There had only been one woman ever ten tenured at the time I was interviewing for a job, Lisa Weisfeld. And uh, the only other woman who was there in a tenure track at the time was Shahan Lin. And there had recently been a woman who had been denied tenure and so I was hearing a lot of these stories. It was actually quite frightening. Uh, I don't remember it being an easy decision. What I do remember is that I wrote two letters about accepting a job or not accepting a job. And I slept on it. And the next morning I switched the names and I sent them off. It was that close. And Marie Davidian was really key to me and giving me advice that bucked up my courage and you know, basically said, if the dream job is Michigan, don't let fear get in the way. Just go, take it on and, and take it from there. And that was such wonderful advice and everything worked out just fine. Uh, the fear wasn't really a fear that I needed to fear any longer in the department. The department climate had changed a lot from when these women had been there. Uh, and I was very happy when I got here. So uh, this is what I remember the faculty being like when I entered. And so you'll see some familiar faces here. So Shahang and I were the only tenure track women. Brenda Gillespie was another female role model around campus who was very helpful. And you see a lot of, none of these faces are really aged for the time I was there. <laughs> I just found whatever was online, but, uh, but there were a lot of just amazing scholars in the department back then. That's Mark Becker. Mark Becker was here when I was uh, when I first came in. He was, you know, one of one of the younger faculty members. The younger faculty members were Shahong, 
uh, Jonathan Raz, Rob Stroderman, and Mark Becker. Uh, Ragu's here. He was actually still at the ISI then. He hadn't joined the department officially, uh, but he but he taught the students. And so we see him all the time. He taught the same. I taught probability. He taught regression to the same cohort of students. So we were always comparing notes in those days. And uh, so I had key biostatistics faculty research mentors at Michigan, one of them who's sitting here right with us, Jeremy Taylor. And I, I, Jeremy has this way of drawing you into interesting research areas. He does this with everyone. It's a real skill. And so very early on when he came, he drew me into this project thinking about multiple imputation of sensor survival outcomes with uh, Paul Sue, who was one, his graduate student. And that work has been so influential for me that you know some variation of multiple imputation of sensor survival outcomes is in many of my students' theses. So it was just enormously helpful to be invited in his backyard uh, to learn some of these important things that, that helped my growth uh, incredibly. And I'm very, very grateful. I wouldn't have not have been as successful without um, the senior faculty member reaching out to me and, and kind of, you know, guiding me in a direction that I hadn't, didn't have to guide myself. Um, and Bob Wolf was also super influential. Um, he got me involved in the scientific registry of transplant recipients that's in charge of doing analyses that guide national policy for organ allocation. And he gave me a lot of freedom to lead the thoracic group related to heart and lung transplantation. Um, and so I was able to grow and lead in that group, eventually changing national allocation policy, uh, which was no trivial task. Uh, but if I ever got into trouble, he was there. So if I had to brainstorm some tricky issues, either politically or statistically, he was there. And uh, his leadership style made it really easy to seek him out one-on-one. -on -one. And I learned a lot from him, um, not just about statistics, but just a wonderful person. So I, you mentioned that uh, I was popular with OJOC. I, I will have to say that that very cohort that gave me a teaching award had these two guys sitting in the front row. And one is Fernando Martinez, one's Kevin Flaherty. One was a, a fellow, I think at the time, and one was kind of almost a senior faculty member. And they were taking OJOC and they needed someone to work with them on pulmonary research projects. Uh, and they were relentless, you know, and uh, it was the best decision I ever made to work with them. And from there, you know, I met mentees, who also, some of which who also went through OJOC and their mentees. And these are all wonderful, very talented people who I've learned from and who have been a very rewarding, like these are the, the stories about working with these people, the stories I can tell my mom I did something useful today, <laughs> you know. Uh, Melon Han, who is uh, almost all the way, top, top row, almost all the way to the right. She is the ultimate multitasker. And I've watched her have a meeting with me about statistical stuff in her office while listening with half an ear to a conference call where she will say, just a minute, blah, 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 and the conference call and be like able to handle it. Uh, a nurse will walk by, she'll say, blah, 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 something patient here. And I said, if you just learn how to tap your head and rub your stomach at the same time, you'll have a record for multitasking. I've watched her very closely over the years. I think without seeing her attempt this, I would have never attempted to do so many things at the same time, but always be multitasking is a good thing that I've learned from her. So there's a little bit of a timeline here. These are some of my students and you'll sort of see, you know, Sherry Catano, she's on here, I saw. And uh, Jimmy, you. And then somehow in here, I started working with the scientific registry of transplant recipients. And then whoa, what happened here? So the year before lung allocation got changed, I had twins. And I, so how do you do that? So how do you work this uh, mentoring and work-life balance situation? So I had a sabbatical that I knew was coming up and I was trying to get pregnant and trying to get pregnant. It was not as actually that easy. 
And I kept on asking Rod Little, the chair, could I just wait one more year to take my sabbatical? Because I was trying to time it so that I could have the kids while I was on sabbatical. And that was enormously helpful that he would allow me to do that because I had to be on bed rest with these twins. And uh, there were some scary periods of time. I mean, everything worked out for the best, everything's fine, but um, they were born early and they were in NICU and it was just an enormous uh, amount of challenge when you're pregnant with twins. And uh, I was very glad that I was on sabbatical and able to handle those life events, you know, at the kind of the same time. And so uh, several students here, Adi, a lot of these students I just love uh, so much, all of them. Adi Andre, you might recognize from way back when, some of you, Lyrica Lu, Fang Shang, maybe a Tayab. Oh, and then came another sabbatical where my kids are holding backpacks. And that sabbatical, I learned how to sew <laughs> so I could do little things like this for the kids and sew them capes for birthday parties and stuff like that, kind of be a homeroom mom for the kindergarten class. And, you know, so I kind of <laughs> tried to time these sabbaticals where I could have an impact, you know, on the kids' upbringing. And uh, this kind of gets us kind of closer up to date. Laura Fernandez, who I co advised with Jeremy, uh, my graduate student, Summer, and uh, here's Ijwa as well, kind of sitting in the corner here. So I think that I kind of have to wrap up. And uh, I have a lot of pictures here. The, most, the rest of this is pictures. And so, you know, here's uh, Adi winning the John Van Ryzen Award, which was huge. A lot of my friends from the very first year I was teaching here, and you might recognize some of these, but there's Jason Roy. He's going to be coming soon to give a talk here at Michigan. And there's Sherry, who's on the call. Phil Westgate, who is a GSRA, and be at Tyob, who's at Harvard now. Uh, Nicole who, Carlson, who is in Colorado. All these people. Oh, and Leslie McClure, she's the chair at Drexel. And you know, all these people kind of grew up uh, right here at Michigan, became all these wonderful people. So this is kind of the future that, you know, the people you see that you can become uh, in your future. And of course, pictures of Eric a while back. And then I think it was Movember, he decided to grow a lot of facial hair. I think it's kind of funny, but I couldn't have been successful without this guy. He had such a modern attitude about cooking and housework and child rearing. And he knew it was a two person job and we've always found a way to divide and conquer. And I just couldn't have done it without him. And I, no mom can resist kid pics. So <laughs> a lot of, it's a lot easier to get pictures of them when they're little, teenagers run. Uh, they do not, and if you get a picture of them and they're like looking at you like, okay, you got me, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and then of course, uh, a lot of friends, good, very good friends. My, I had a book club that I was in and all of these women kind of helped me get through the tenure process. Uh, my cousin Jill, who somehow I never found a way to get her picture in the talk otherwise, but that's us there on the far left and very good friends. Gail Mahalka, Ted London, who's in the business school. And um, I don't know if any of you know Carrie Engelberg, but uh, Kent, Carrie and Susie Engelberg, we've been going to the opera for years, uh, season ticket holders and have just been going on for years. So I don't uh, need to hold you here. I think that's the end, but if, you if you're curious and you want to ever ask me, here are some potential conversation starters. Like, uh, I don't have a middle name, ask me why, you know? Why? Well, my parents thought I would take my husband's name and they wanted to make sure I kept Murray as a middle name that I didn't like pick whatever Sadie Hawkins or whatever name that was middle. They wanted to make sure I kept Murray. So they only gave me Susan and Murray and they thought I would get my third name when I married, but. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, mom, didn't do it. <laughs> and so another conversation started asking me how I learned to play the trumpet very badly. And it, not necessarily now, but it's a conversation starter. And this is, this is my sister's, one of my sister's favorite stories. So college students who worked with me at my first job, uh, did I even talk about this? I might've skipped that slide. I worked at a, I kind of won a job at a science fair when I was a freshman in high school and I was like interpreting National Weather Center numbers and making little wind maps so that meteorologists could look at them. And the other people who worked there were college students, they're all college guys. And they were constantly pranking the little kid. And so what was the worst prank and how did I deal with it? And that is actually one of my sister's favorite stories. If you ever wanna have a conversation starter with me or you could ask me 
Uh, who did I talk to other than Butch about advising? And there's a story there as well. So that's it for me. And I'm so, uh, you know, hopefully I didn't go too far over here, but, uh, you know, it's actually amazing that I didn't spend three hours telling stories because I tend to go that direction as a teacher. But uh, thank you again for coming. And that's it. many, many students, and I can tell you that uh, the year that I arrived, Susan was the only female faculty in Michigan by statistics, and so, uh, and I was very, very deeply grateful to have someone else. So I, I really thank you for all of these years for your contribution to Michigan by statistics, and I just want to open up the floor for the Zoom audience as well as those who are here uh, for questions for Susan. I have a comment. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, Susan. Can you please say your name as well? Because we cannot... I'm Sherry Messenger, and my claim to fame is that I was Susan's very first student. And I think Susan should tell everybody how she made me ask her to be my advisor. I don't remember. Oh, <laughs> yes, you do. I don't I mean, I'm old and decrepit now. Walking across the bridge from the hospital to where your car was parked after getting the keys from Eric, you made me get down on one knee and ask you to be my advisor. You don't remember this? There's, I've forgotten so much, but that's very much in character. I would have been like, this is like marriage. <laughs> Make it count. <laughs> but on a serious note, I mean, Susan, you are, um, very largely responsible for the path I took in life and were, has, have been a mentor to me, a friend, an advisor, a mentor, both academically and personally. And I just have, just hearing your voice brings me comfort. I can't explain how or why, but it does. So I'm very grateful for your being in my life. And vice versa, right back at you, Sherry. I pulled a picture of you up. I hope you appreciate that was the last conference in Miami. Oh, I remember. I remember the sangria or the, was that sangria or mojitos? I don't remember which one. I, I remember maybe. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember. We, we, sampled. we had a picture of something. That's all I remember. Yes. I, Are you going to be in Houston for Enar? I hadn't even thought about it. I'm actually going to be going to Texas uh, very soon to help my mom do taxes, which is. You should do that around Enar. That way you can go to Enar. Well, she, I don't think she wants me to wait. Um, so <laughs> I'm leaving. I re, my, the first date that I had scheduled for this talk that got switched, I plan to drive the day after to Texas. And I think that's still the plan. But, uh, but yeah, um, that's actually something I hadn't even thought about. But thanks for suggesting that. That's a great idea. Are you going to go? Pending, but if you go, it's definitely going to sway me. Yeah, well, let me know. We'll talk. Okay. Other questions? Anybody on Zoom, you can unmute yourself. We can all hear you. Susan, I do have a question for you. So, um, you know, you have seen it all, the changes in the faculty dynamics in Michigan by statistics and in or in students also change over time. Uh, so how has it been to just really experience, even I feel that in 2006 when I arrived, there were very few female faculty. Now we have so many tenured professors and full professors. How does it feel to see the tide change? Well, I have to say that I've only been a search chair once the year that we hired for Mar. And we hired four women that year. And, I, and that was just like a huge shift, you know. Shahang had just moved on, so I really was kind of the lone face that people would see. Brenda was here, Brenda's always been here. But we hired four women, women that year. And I think it was because when I would pick people up at the airport, there were two baby car seats in the back. You know, my kids were still in car seat age. And just seeing 
okay, there's only one of her, but, you know, she's doing it all and it's working out. And I think that was just reassuring enough that whatever fear um, that I had experienced during that, during that same process, I think that was e a little bit easier to manage just seeing the, the image of the car seats of twins <laughs> in my minivan, you know, and we did really well. And, um, and, you, and of course you've been just a wonderful, I've been lucky with really great chairs with Ron and with Ragu, all of these people were building and building and, and uh, you know, making the department more diverse and, and doing all the right things. And, and there's just nothing quite like being a female chair and seeing that continue with Bramar. Uh, and so it's been nice. It's a little kind of funny to look back and, and see that I was the only one at one point, but I think it was just, uh, it wasn't that way everywhere, I mean, at Harvard, I saw a lot of, of balance. It just took a little bit of time to kind of build up in Michigan in the same way. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think one thing that Peter mentioned that he was the first only chair and that he also hired a lot of women. So these are very specific things that when you have women uh, leading churches and women leading a department is more focused. Um, and I love all of the past year, but it has been wonderful to see the change in the diversity uh, we have a long way to go, but thanks to you, because I think you were very supportive and very uh, forgiving of us as we came into and grew together. Well, it's very kind words, but um, there was no doubt of the, the stardom in the process that was happening with when we hired you. It was just very clear to everyone. And, and, and I wanted to hear the butch story that you said that you could Oh, hear. okay. So... I don't know if Butch is still on, but uh, <laughs> so I, he already had three students. One of them was a classmate. And I don't know what it's like here at, in Michigan when students are trying to find an advisor, but it's almost like I called him. And you know, when your friend says, I'm gonna work with so-and-so, they're kind of like off the list. And so my friend, Tony Rossini got to Butch and, and I was watching all the professors kind of get ticked off. And um, so I didn't even think about talking to Butch at first. I just didn't think he would take on a fourth student. I didn't see other faculty members who had four students. And I just didn't think it was a possibility. So I really was talking to Nan Laird. And I, can you imagine, I mean, she was the chair of the department, super awesome researcher, really wonderful. It was, she was very much in the mold of Kathy Enzer for me of, you know, there's a, there's a person I can try to be that and see how she manages the balance of work and life and everything. And I, and I got uh, so excited. And so I'd been talking to her for a while and I, I went into her office one day and she says, you know, Susan, I'm so sorry, but I just am too busy being chair right now to take on another student. Oh, and by the way, you really need to find an advisor as soon as possible, or you could probably lose your funding. And I just <laughs> looked at her and I, and I just burst into tears. <laughs> I just burst into tears and I was okay actually at first I was really holding you know the whole lip that's probably trembling a little bit but I was holding it together and then she looks at me she says you're not gonna cry are you and I just <laughs> <laughs> and I, I look back and I smile because I was just so in love with Nan Laird and the idea of working with her and I look back and smile you know at that memory she was so nice to me after that I mean she probably thought I was on a hair trigger to burst into tears so like you know, um, will you be on my committee, Nan? Oh, sure, sure, I'll be on your committee, sure, you know. Or Nan, will you write a letter of recommendation for me? Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely, you know. And so she was always so nice to me after that. I was just kind of like, yeah, nice. And, uh, and it, everything worked out great because Butch did take on a fourth student. I'm not sure how he manages to do that many students all at one time. Certainly some faculty around here are very good at that as well, but uh, it, it was it was the perfect perfect fit, and uh, Tony Rossini I think forgave me for dividing Butch's time with me, and it worked out very well actually. So that's my story about. <laughs> Nan's loss is my gain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you heard that story. <laughs> who joined online, thank you very much. Uh, this is the, uh, you know, the journey lectures really help us to come together and know our colleagues better who we have known 
for many years, but do not really know. So we have heard a lot about alcohol. And so again, I, we saw pictures of beer bottles hidden behind and also sangria and so on. So uh, here's a bottle of wine and some dark chocolate for you, Susan. Thank you. And hope you enjoy them. Uh, Thank you. With your teenagers. And this is very important. This is the certificate of gratitude on behalf of the department presented to Susan for oh, that's really sharing nice. her journey with us. So let us all congratulate to Susan. Thank you everyone for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you for being a part of the department. Those of you who are here for the journey, plus also food. We initially, I, I'll have to tell you a little story. We initially planned for tex Max, but then the room got shifted and the caterers got changed. So you have bought food with sandwich and pastries and coffee, but please do take them along. Uh, you are welcome to sit in the hall, in the room as well, but please make sure that you make a trip. It's right outside this room, is that right? Yeah. And for, for those of you who are at Zoom, uh, uh, we cannot really do Zoom delivery yet, uh, but uh, please have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining. Thanks for being a part of Michigan Biostatistics and a part of Susan's journey.